It's my first trip home since my father died. A year has passed. I have come home to celebrate Hazel's 80th birthday. She's been in and out of the hospital from not eating, but is now learning to live without Cliff. And that birth certificate said that my parents gave birth to me. And I knew they didn't. Being adopted, you can't help but wonder what your life would be like if a different family had taken you home. My first mother was erased from my history. So I understood from a really early age that, um, that, there's, <laughs> that there's a difference between recorded history and lived history. I guess I say I'm a nonfiction artist because I'm a writer, a filmmaker, installation artist. The forms that I usually choose are forms that have a lot of veracity. Truth-telling forms, in other words, uh, text, photography, film, are all forms that people tend to accept as representing some aspect of the truth. You know, there's a saying, there's no justice without visibility. I try to use my platform as an artist to bring stories to the public that might not otherwise be visible, if you will. Give voice to people who've been in some way silenced. And in some ways maybe counteracting what people normally see. I was teaching at the time for the Maryland Institute College of Art. I was at an exhibition opening. I saw a woman that looked very familiar to me. She walked up to me and with no introduction whatsoever, she said, you could be my long lost daughter. And I said, you know, you don't know what you're saying to me. I was adopted, I could be your daughter. So of course the next thing she asked was, have you looked for your mother? And I said, oh, you know, you know, she probably wouldn't want to hear from me. You know, I'm a big skeleton in her closet. And oh my God, she looked at me and kind of pointed her finger at me and said, you have no idea. She probably has worried every single day of her life about you. So this was like a giant light bulb going off for me because I thought I understood, <laughs> you know, women's history. I thought I understood um, adoption, but I had never heard the story of adoption out of the mouth of a woman who actually had to surrender the child that gets adopted. When I was about four months pregnant, they loaded me up in the car and they drove me on the longest drive of my whole life to this home for unwed mothers. I remember crying all the way and still not understanding why I had to go away. And so women didn't even get to grieve. They just simply, you know, went away. You know, in the beginning, it's a kind of crisis. By the end, you know, they're mothers. And they let me hold her. And I looked at her and I told her, I have to do what I'm told. But I said, I swear to you, when you're 18 years old, I'm going to find you. I love you and I don't want to do this. Some of these women have suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. They've had all kinds of weird illnesses that couldn't be diagnosed. And when they got back in reunion and met their child and understood their child was safe and had a good life, the symptoms disappeared. It's, it's monumental. After World War II, I mean, you know, you move to the suburbs, you have a swing set and a station wagon, you have at least two kids, 2.5 kids or whatever. If you were not living that life, you were sort of suspect. If you have a scared teenager whose family says, we will fall dramatically out of the middle class if anybody finds out our daughter's pregnant. You know, most of these women didn't really make a choice. They didn't have two viable options. A choice requires two options. They were put on a conveyor belt and told, this is what you have to do. If you love your child, you must give it up. As I was doing this autobiographical work and doing exhibits, I, um, I would leave space in those exhibits for other people to contribute their story. So I had special places where other people who were connected to adoption, adoptive families, adoptees, 
uh, or first moms, first dads, uh, so that they could write stories and post them and they would be part of the exhibit. In 2002, I initiated an oral history project to collect these stories. And I collected stories all over the country between 2002 and 2005. And I collected stories until I had 100 stories. And from that, I, um, those were part of the raw material for a film. Riding in that car, and I felt really important. Wow, ah, this is what dating is like. I mean, things were a lot different then. And no one talked about sex. There was no sex education in school. Um, I could tell that he knew a little bit more, and as ridiculous as it sounds, um, I was learning from him. Some audio installations. I started gaining weight, and I missed my second period, sex and I still tried to deny it. The plan didn't include my daddy called me my a becoming whore. pregnant at that point in time. I think his family accepted it. My family, on the other hand, was. Totally, what have you done to totally my against son? Us getting married. And a book that um, came out in 2006, a nonfiction book called The Girls Who Went Away. Each way that I put it out there, it emphasizes a different aspect of the story that I want to tell. As I was working up to um, the, the oral history project with the women, I started reflecting back on my own experience growing up and also I wanted to tell the story of going to the town to try to find a yearbook picture of my mother. I could have gone about it in the usual way, but then I would have been like every other sniveling child at my school. There would have been no lowered voices as they explained to one another how I was different. I, I probably got 10,000 emails when the book came out. My mom treated it like it was her personal tragedy. You know, you don't know what this means to me. I thought I was the only one. That's what they thought. It didn't happen to nice girls, but nice girls do get pregnant. My family made me feel like I was, you know, horrible and bad and the black sheep of the family. Because you are so bad and so flawed for just having this happen, there's no way you could possibly provide what a child would need. I mean, the women themselves didn't have a context for what was going on. They were part of a larger phenomenon. I just felt like I had done this horrific thing, and I was not in any position to protest or say, you know, what I wanted. There have been a lot of reunions as a result of the book and the film. There have been a lot of people who've come out of the closet about their experiences and talked to their subsequent children about those experiences. Um, uh, my own mother being one of them. There was no living person who knew this had happened to her, and she was going to take it to her grave. I was three months pregnant, and she said, you don't look it now, but you will soon, and so I want you out of this house. And she said, if you keep your baby, never come back. So I hear from people um, all the time, you know, who say it was really helpful and, you know, I prepared them for a reunion or... They send me pictures from reunions that they say they wouldn't have had if they didn't, you know, if they hadn't understood what their mother went through, that they thought, you know, they had just been tossed aside. It's extremely, you know, rewarding. I, I have no reason to stop doing it. Mm -hmm.